This is CBC Here and Now. The commissioner goes so far as to say that, uh, you know, she was being disingenuous about the allegation, which, you know, is a nice way of saying you're being dishonest. Dale Kirby cleared of harassment and bullying allegations made by a fellow MHA. But the report reveals questionable behavior amongst liberal politicians. Good evening, I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Debbie Cooper. One of the MHAs accused of harassment in the House of Assembly has been cleared of almost all accusations. A report released today details specific allegations made by Liberal backbencher Pam Parsons against Dale Kirby. Yeah, and it's quite the report. And while the former cabinet minister is certainly content that he has been cleared of most of the harassment allegations in this report, it's important to note that he rejects the one that uh, was made against him or he's found guilty of. But his colleague, MHA Pam Parsons, made eight allegations. Uh, seven of them, as I mentioned, were rejected. Now, what's important about this report is, and incredible about it, this report peels away a curtain and exposes some odd and objectionable behavior between Liberal politicians, as Debbie stated. So let's start with one issue, and that's busing. This has to do with the 1.6 kilometer rule. If you live within that, you have to walk. Outside, you get a bus. Well, MHA Pam Parsons says that Kirby sent her a text message that said, you are causing me an F load of trouble by being vocal about this 1.6 kilometer busing policy. Now, Kirby says that he discovered that Pam Parson, in her turn, had allegedly called him an effing coward for leaving a caucus meeting before the 1.6 kilometer busing policy could be discussed. Now, the commissioner found that Kirby did send Pam Parson the F load text message and that he deserves to be reprimanded for that. Another issue, the Liberal Convention and Annual General Meeting in November of 2016, this was in Gander, lots of Liberals getting together, as they do. Now, Parsons says that Kirby told her, quote, he wanted to get along with me and said, you are beautiful and I love you and I want us to work together, but you have to stop being so vocal. Now, Kirby says he doesn't remember making those comments, but he also stated that he wasn't denying that he made them either. Now, he did say that he wanted to provide some context for these remarks. Pam Parsons, he said, asked me if I wanted to smoke marijuana with her, and we proceeded to the parking lot and smoked marijuana. This was at the Hotel Gander during the convention, as I mentioned. Now, Kirby says he might have said that he liked her, but, quote, he did so in an aging punk rocker 1980s way. Now, Kirby goes on to say this wasn't a serious conversation. We were smoking weed, and it's absurd. Now, the commissioner agreed with Kirby, stating that he was credible because none of these events portrayed the then Minister of Education in a favorable light. Now, one more. There are more in the report, but we'll deal with three tonight. The Christmas break from the House of Assembly in December of 2016. Pam Parsons alleges the Liberals were at a local pub in St. John's, the grumpy stump, when she says a patron told her, I don't believe it is right what was just done to you. We witnessed Dale Kirby put two rounds of drinks on your tab. Now, Parsons says she asked the bartender and he confirmed that Kirby had dinged her for two rounds. And Parsons says Justice Minister Andrew Parsons intervened and stopped Kirby from adding the drinks to her tab. Now, when the commissioner interviewed the justice minister, he couldn't remember that actually happening. As for Dale Kirby, he bluntly stated, I did not add a round to the bar tab at the Grumpy Stump. These allegations are false. And Kirby added that he's picky with money and he would not screw, quote, with somebody else's money. Now, the commissioner agreed with Kirby's version of events, also accusing Pam Parsons at times of being disingenuous. So that's just a sampling of what's in this remarkable report from Bruce Chalk. Now, my colleague Jeremy Eaton, he managed to catch up with Dale Kirby late this afternoon at the House of Assembly where all of this has unfolded. It's all about the behavior among MHAs. Jeremy is there now live. So what did Mr. Kirby have to say? Anthony, this is the room where politicians come to when they want to speak to the media. And anybody who's been following Dale Kirby's political career knows that the MHA isn't quiet for long. And this afternoon, he had a lot to say about that report, one that he sent to us. Now, here's Kirby explaining why he did that. I had this cloud of suspicion hanging over me for six months. I mean, I've had my name printed in articles and everything to do with domestic violence and sexual assault and so on and so forth. So when I didn't engage in any kind of behavior remotely approximating that, like I said, my colleagues decided to use these harassment complaints as a political weapon to beat me over the head with. Now, Kirby obviously isn't very happy with former caucus colleague Pam Parsons or 
Bruce Chuck. Now, one of the most damning parts of this report that people on social media have been getting worked up about is what Anthony mentioned, and that's when Kirby, the then head, head of the Department of Education, the Minister of Education, sorry, and Parsons were smoking marijuana long before it was legal. Are you upset that Commissioner Chalk wrote about you and Pam Parsons smoking marijuana when you were the head of education? I think it's inappropriate for him to talk about my personal life in, you know, in a report. And if you read the report, I assume you have, what does that add to it in terms of what he was... Well, it was what, illegal. What, what, what was he supposed to be looking at and what does that have to do with it? Kirby said he hasn't spoken to Premier Dwight Ball today and he doesn't know if he will be let back into caucus. But he did tell me that the last six months have been hard on him and his family. So, like for me, in, in all of this, if I say one thing positive, it's that I had more time to spend with my son and I had more time to spend with my family. You going to run again in a year's time, Dale? I don't know, man. I mean, we'll have to wait and see how it all... Now, as Anthony said, the report recommends that Kirby be reprimanded. So I reached out to Bruce Chalk, the man who wrote the report, to get comment from him about that. But his office told me that because the report hasn't actually been released publicly, they weren't going to publicly speak about it. But the government soon will. Now, very late this afternoon, the Speaker Perry Trimper sent out a news release saying that the House of Assembly will reconvene in that room behind me on Tuesday at 1.30 so that they can consider the report. So we will be hearing more about this early next week. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Jeremy Eaton at Confederation Building in St. John's. Well, still ahead tonight, the Crown wins an appeal, a new trial for an RNC officer. Constable Carl Douglas Snellgrove facing a sexual assault case once again. Astaldi is on the way out of Muskrat Falls. Nalcor told the company to leave the site yesterday afternoon, and today that is happening. Here now is Katie Breen's been following this story. Katie, what's going on? Well, there's still work going on at Muskrat Falls. Astaldi has stopped, but other work, other contractors are going forward. Nalcor says there will be no delay to the overall project. It says Astaldi has finished about 95% of its work. For the remaining 5%, Nalcor says it's working on a plan B. We'll be discussing with the priorities and take some time over the next two or three weeks to sort all this out. The Inu Nation met with Nalcor CEO today and was given insight into what that alternate plan could involve. One of the things that they, the, that they talked about is uh, getting some other workforce to, to Nalcor. So they're trying to train Astaldi employees to keep doing the same work just as Nalcor employees? Yeah. Nalcor says this would not be Astaldi's workforce, but in the meantime, it has arranged transportation for Astaldi workers to leave the site and head home. Trades NL, an umbrella group responsible for the workers, wouldn't do an interview today, but sent out a release saying it was working on the issue. The group is currently suing Astaldi for allegedly not paying into pension and benefits programs. Nalcor has said there are financial protections in place for those workers. Trades NL wants the Premier to step in and advocate on their behalf. And the Premier, who also wouldn't do an interview today, said the government's priorities are with the workers affected and that his government would continue to work to ensure rights are protected. This latest drama began yesterday when Nalcor issued Astaldi a stop work order, concerned that the company wouldn't be able to make payroll. I haven't talked with Astaldi in recent days. There's, there's been a lot of complications in recent weeks with Astaldi in terms of court actions mm -hmm. and whatnot. So, no, I haven't been in direct contact with them. Our people have, obviously, been arranging for transportation for the employees and demobilization. Now, I did reach out to Astaldi today for a comment. And while I did reach someone who said they were working on something, I haven't gotten it. Reporting live from the newsroom, I'm Katie Breen for Here and Now. Well, for more on this, let's go to the Happy Valley Goose Bay Airport right now where Muskrat Falls workers are waiting for their flights home. Here and Now's Jacob Barker is there with us live tonight. So, Jacob, tell us just what's happening. Yeah, so, Anthony, just a few minutes ago, I watched the first plane uh, of the day board and leave uh, behind me. You can see uh, a number of other workers, uh, just some of the 500 that have to find uh, their way home uh, tonight. And, and Nalcor is busy making arrangements for them to do that. 
and, and it's well underway here. In fact, here at, at the airport, there was some pizza and some hot coffee to greet them. Certainly welcome after what was uh, likely a very uh, different day. Uh, I can tell you that buses left the site on a board and go basis late this afternoon. Nalcor uh, said the planes were supposed to begin leaving at about two o'clock this afternoon, but I can say they actually started boarding closer to five. And like I said, they just took off. Uh, I did have a chance to speak with some of the guys here. Uh, not many did want to speak on camera, uh, but they said, you know, for guys that have been working on the site for years, they've seen a lot over the years. They say they feel they saw a lot of wasted, wastage and other missteps taken uh, while they were working on the project. And in more recent months, they said they were running out of supplies, literally scrounging for materials to get the jobs done. Many were not certain of what's happening with them next. Some heard they might be called back to the site, but they're not sure about that. Um, they, there's a lot of uncertainty. I spoke with one worker who said he relied on his job for his family, and he really wasn't certain what was coming next for him. We showed up to work, and they, uh, they asked us to uh, you know, be present at work, and then uh, they sent us home at 12 o'clock. I'm going to apply for work. I got three kids at home, so uh, I need to uh, I need to provide for three kids. So that's what I got to do. I got to apply for another uh, another job there now. So with uh, 500 workers trying to find their way home uh, over the next day or so, uh, it's certainly going to be this scene at the Goose Bay Airport for some time to come. Reporting live for here and now in Happy Valley Goose Bay, I'm Jacob Barker. All this news about Astaldi also has the province's consumer advocate asking questions about how the company was selected to do the job. Dennis Brown says he believes that's something that will be addressed at the Muskrat Falls inquiry. At some point, uh, how Astaldi was retained to do the project uh, as opposed to others who were bid uh, will come under scrutiny at this inquiry. And uh, I think uh, all that will be interesting. Uh, was it best to retain Astaldi? Uh, who did the retention? And still with Muskrat Falls, in 15 minutes, Mark Quinn looks back at a troubling week at the inquiry. People protested in the streets on the day RNC Constable Carl Doug Snellgrove was acquitted of sexual assault in 2017. Now the suspended officer could be heading for a new trial. Here now's Ryan Cook explains. The appeals court dropped a bombshell this morning with a 2-1 ruling that could see Doug Snellgrove head to trial once again. Now the same testimony we heard last year would be rehashed here again at the Supreme Court. You'll remember this entire area of the city was home to protests on the day that Snellgrove was cleared of rape. Outside, people chanted, yelled and cried in the streets. They were incensed by the images of Snellgrove inside, crying and hugging his supporters. Snellgrove was accused of picking up a drunken young woman on George Street while on duty. He drove her home, helped her break into her house. She remembers waking up and Snellgrove was having sex with her. She told the court it's possible she consented, but she couldn't remember. The appeal focuses on a specific part of the criminal code. There are different reasons someone cannot consent. One is intoxication. Another one is abuse of power. A trial judge refused to instruct the jury on abuse of power. She didn't believe there was enough evidence to say that Snellgrove used his position as a police officer to have sex with the complainant. Two appeals judges have now ruled she should have left that up to the jury. I spoke with Crown Prosecutor Lloyd Strickland earlier today. He says they're pleased with the appeals court decision and they intend to take this to trial once again. Now Snellgrove has 30 days to appeal this decision to the Supreme Court of Canada, but Strickland says no matter how long it takes, he hopes they get a second shot at convicting Doug Snellgrove. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. <laughs> First chat about the weather, as you could see there with Ryan Cook downtown today. The, the street was wet, 
Uh, not nearly as bad as it was early this morning, though. That's lots right. of rain. We did. We saw lots of rain push through parts of the Avalon. We'll take a look at the radar from this afternoon. Uh, we saw streams of rain move through. Now, through the overnight, we're still going to see that continue, along with the potential for some flurry activity through the central, through parts of central. Now, the big story really is uh, this special weather statement. It's all the rain that's on the way as we head for uh, Saturday and into Sunday. Already have rainfall warnings along the coast, otherwise a special weather statement. That's because most of this rain will fall into Sunday, so it is still a little bit early. And then up through Nain, that special weather statement in effect as well. It does look like uh, some snow is on the way, 20, potentially even 30 centimeters. It's very messy for parts of Labrador and then all that rain on the way for the island. I will spell all of that out for you. And uh, it looks windy too, but we'll have that coming up in a little bit. Anthony? All right, thanks, Ashley. A raid on an illegal cannabis dispensary in St. John's could be the first of many. That's the message from the Newfoundland and Labrador Liquor Corporation as it displayed products that it seized during last night's bust. But while the NSC targets illegal cannabis retailers, many legal shops are struggling to get weed on their shelves. Here now, Zach Gowdy has a story. It was a throwback to the old days of last week. Cannabis and cannabis products seized in a late night raid, stuffed into evidence bags and displayed for the media. If there's more illegal dispensaries operating, you can be satisfied in knowing that there will be more uh, seizures of product. Last night, the NLC raided Water Street Cannabis Care, one of several illegal cannabis dispensaries that had been operating in St. John's for months. The NLC had publicly threatened to shut down the illegal pot shops as soon as legalization came into effect. And on the day of legalization, the inspectors also visited all of the illegal dispensaries with the view to say, look, you know, today is legalization day and you're not legal. But at the legal cannabis retailers, cannabis is hard to find. Many shops sold out on the first day and haven't been resupplied since. There's part of you that is really, really happy that it's such a success um, and it's going really well. But then there's the other part of you as the business owner that you just wish that you had more on hand. Every time you turn that person away or they walk through that door and you say, sorry, sold out, a little piece of my heart breaks. As the bust at Cannabis Care was happening, customers kept showing up. Several had already tried the legal retailers without success. I was at Dominion this morning, but uh, Dominion everywhere else is sold out of cannabis, so I guess we try from there. The NLC acknowledges the irony that supply shortages at legal retailers are likely driving people to seek out illegal cannabis. It hopes that licensed stores will have more product in the next few days. I can tell you uh, that supply is, pr is probably the number one concern of every cannabis retailer or controller within this country right now. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. Gruesome details revealed in court today in the killing of a man in Conception Bay South more than two years ago. Paul Connolly was convicted of manslaughter in the death of Stephen Miller. He is one of four men involved in Miller's death. The new details show the men were trying to rob Miller of drugs. Miller was beaten and stabbed and left to die in a driveway. The other men in the case have already been sentenced. And we have detailed a breakdown of this case on our website. You can check it out yourself at cbc.ca slash nl. Well, Lillian Goss thought that she had won $20 when the cashier behind the counter decided she'd better correct her because, in fact, she was holding a million-dollar ticket. So Goss and her husband plan on sharing the winnings with their kids. They also plan on purchasing a new armchair. Like you would. <laughs> and they're also planning a trip to Carboneer. You don't know how you feel, like, you know, when they're telling you what you want. You're and trying to get it all in there. And at first you thought it was a, a smaller amount? $1,000. Right? <laughs> and then you said it was 100000 And No, too many zeros for that. And she said a million. And uh, I, was, so <laughs> I went in and I said, uh, we want a million dollars. And he said, no, we didn't. I said, yes, I did. And I said, um, I swear on my grandchildren's lives. And anyway, he looked and uh, it was like a slow motion. He got up and put his arms around me. <laughs>
And what was going through your mind? Did you believe Lillian Gord? He well, didn't. I didn't believe her at first. No. How much convincing did it take? When she, Not much. <laughs> when she swore on the grandchildren's lives the night. She wouldn't do that. And that's what she got. When I got the call the next morning, I knew. I knew. Like I didn't suspect, I knew. I knew she was gone. I knew she was murdered. It's been nearly two years since Jennifer Hillier Penny vanished. The Fifth Estate returns to St. Anthony on Sunday evening for part two of Finding Jennifer. Tune in at 9.30 in Newfoundland, 9 o'clock in most of Labrador to see that investigation. Here now, we'll be back in just a few minutes. Martin O'Hara traveled the world, but he didn't find home until he found Burgio. The Burgio come from away, Sunday at noon and Monday at 7. Well, to the West Coast now in Corner Brook, the long, slow process of installing a bridge unfolded today. Now, this time lapse you're going to look at makes it look much faster than it actually is because this bridge is only moving six inches at a time would sound faster in metric, I guess. The new Main Street Bridge had been built adjacent to the old one over the last few months, and today the painstakingly slow process of moving that new bridge started. It's an amazing feat of engineering. Still, a lot more work to do, though. Debbie, it's not going to be open for traffic for another month. Oh, I bet the townspeople wish they could keep up that speed. Yeah, they're the eager. They're eager. They certainly are. Wow.
So there you go, workers outside. Look like a nice day. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't too bad, but uh, I think you were saying the weekend, lots of weather. Yeah. I don't know if they're going to continue working, you know, seven days a week or not. Yeah, not I don't know either. If they are out this weekend, though, they might want to get their heavy rain gear uh, on, that's for sure. But uh, as we mentioned, look like a nice day. Temperatures this afternoon, not too bad. A little cooler than we saw yesterday, sitting around five degrees here in St. John, six in Corner Brook, three in Badger. And then Labrador City this afternoon uh, sitting at about minus five. Those temperatures still pretty uh, similar to what we saw earlier today. Happy Valley Goose Bay sitting around minus two and then Badger at three degrees. Tem generally looking at those temperatures in the single digits as we head through the night tonight. Now earlier I mentioned we saw uh, plenty of rainfall along the Avalon on the Avalon today. That will continue as we head through the night tonight. And we're going to see more cloud cover move in with that chance of flurries for parts of central as well. So taking a look at the future tracker as we head through the night tonight, there's a look at that potential for some flurries along uh, the northern peninsula as well in the west coast. Happy Valley Goose Bay, or rather most of uh, Labrador, should clear out through the overnight tonight. But then the next system moves in, and this is a significant weather maker uh, over the next 36 to 48 hours. We'll see that snow push in by the time the morning rolls around uh, significant snowfall amounts as well associated with this system uh, somewhere between 10 maybe even 15 centimeters of snow and then up through Nain, it should all stay as snow so we could see upwards of about 30 centimeters by the time Sunday rolls around so into the afternoon we'll see this line this is going to be uh, the difference between the rain and the rain to the south and the snow to the north that pushes further north changing things over to rain into the afternoon and towards the coast as well and then take a look at this so this is the first round of heavy rain making its way through the southern portions of uh, the island and will continue into to Sunday and then it doesn't stop right into Monday. We're going to see those periods of rain continue heavy at times. You could see uh, sometimes upwards of 15 millimeters an hour falling uh, into the afternoon. So no uh, surprise that we have that special weather statement in effect. That rainfall warning along the coast right now, it will likely get sp and spread further east uh, through the day tomorrow and the Nain will likely see that snowfall warning as well. So as far as tonight's forecast goes, breezy for uh, the south coast. Port Abbas going down to about six degrees tonight with rain possible. Uh, more rain or snow along the west coast and then towards uh, the central areas as well. I have partly cloudy skies, but we could see a few flurries in there as well. Minus three for Grand Falls, Windsor. Minus one for Gander. St. Anthony sitting around minus one as well. And then towards the Avalon, we're going to hang on to that chance of showers, eventually clearing for Marystown with a low near minus two. So that's a look at tonight's forecast. We will go into detail on when that rain is going to come for the day tomorrow and into Sunday when I come up in a little bit. Debbie? Today at the Muskrat Falls Inquiry, the man charged with looking out for the interests of ratepayers says he would have done things differently. Consumer advocate Dennis Brown has been following the project since day one, and he says the information that came to light during the last few days has made for a troubling week at the inquiry. Here now's Mark Quinn reports. So far, uh, I sense confusion. First, there was this revelation. An independent project review told Nalcor before sanction that it was lowballing the project's cost by billions. The estimate had been completed to a higher P factor, it wouldn't have been 6.4. It might have been 7 or 8 to begin with, with 10% on top of that. They had all the warning signs, but they seemed to know better than everyone else. Then there was testimony detailing that almost all of the project's top executives had no experience working on hydroelectric projects. The project team at Nelcor were, in fact, oil and gas people. And uh, it makes you wonder if... Uh, uh, when oil and gas people were doing a project, would they use all hydroelectric people? Doubtful. Good morning, everybody. Brown says it was also clearly a mistake to circumvent the PUB. We had an opportunity to put it before our own public utilities board fairly and squarely, the way uh, EMIRA was required to do in Nova Scotia. But here, because the proponent... Uh, uh, Nalcor and the government became one and the same. There was no one really looking out for the public interest. 
And that leads to next week at the inquiry, when former members of the PUB, including former Utilities Board Chair Andy Wells, are scheduled to testify. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. The recreational food fishery is over for another year, but I checked in with DFO to talk about the season that was. I'm Jeremy Eaton, I'll have that story coming up. Welcome back to Here and Now. The recreational food fishery is over for another year, but the Department of Fisheries and Oceans is still catching people who just aren't following the rules. Here and Now's Jeremy Eaton spoke with an enforcement officer earlier today. It was a very uh, on par season with other years. Uh, you know, we had about the same level of participation and everything. Our violations were down slightly, but there was a few days less to the fishery this year as well. DFO says that there were 32 violations in total, six written warnings and 26 charges, most of them for exceeding the daily limit. Each year we find that people are, are taking that risk and of course we'll respond accordingly and try to, to do our best to, uh, to catch people at that type of activity. Last season there were 46 days for fishing, this year just 39 and in the summer with people allowed to get on the water for 10 three-day weekends plus nine days in the fall. 
It was fine for us because we have work plans done up at each of our detachments and you know we'll always try to do the best we can uh, with, the, with the activity levels and have people on schedule at that time. Earlier this year, it looked like DFO may be moving to a tag system to keep an eye on the COD stocks, but it never rolled it out this year. Well, we had some consultations last year and, and they, they, they sought input from the public on that. But in the end this year, we decided to go to, you know, the same type of fishery where it was just open, no license, no tags. And it's hard to say what will happen for next year yet. With the recreational food fishery over for another year, the only thing left for DFO to do now is figure out what the schedule will look like for next year. Will it be the one two years ago or the one that we saw this past season? And that's something DFO says it will take time to figure out. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. A ceremonial sod turning took place at Government House in St. John's today. Lieutenant Governor Judy Foote helped take the first step in creating a garden that pays tribute to Indigenous people sent to residential schools. The Heart Garden also honors the families of those children who were taken. Munns Botanical Gardens will help create the garden in the spring, and stone from Labrador is expected to be included. There will also be benches for people to sit and reflect on that dark moment in Canada's past. Uh, it was nearly a hundred years ago that my grandmother was taken from her home, much younger than many of you here today, and put into residential schooling. My parents were survivors of residential school and my older siblings. So I'd like to thank your honors for the invitation and, and more importantly, the, the memorial that's going to be uh, put in place here at the Heart Garden. How long does it take you to become Irma? Uh, it takes me. It can take up to four hours. Well, this is not for the faint of heart. The uh, Jeremy Eaton version of Hero Now continues as he gets his very own drag mother, politics fish, and stay tuned for what's next. Jeremy, we're ready for you in makeup. <laughs> It is nice. Another beautiful sunrise. I'm Fred Hutton. I have been in broadcast media really since about 1985, and that'll take you back to my days at CHMR Radio, Mun Radio. 
What is so special about The best part of my job is meeting people. Morning radio is important to the community because you get to spend more time talking to people. You delve a little bit deeper in there. I grew up in this meadow right here. I always try to get some sort of a personal side. It gives people a better sense of who you're talking to. <laughs> in my downtime, I like to uh, spend time outdoors. I also love playing golf. Love hiking too. My wife and I spend a fair bit of time hiking with our dog. I've had opportunities to leave Newfoundland and Labrador to work, but I've always made a choice to stay here. It's family and friends that sort of keep you rooted here, and I'm, I'm definitely one of those people. Well, the queen of the night will be crowned at Club One in St. John's tomorrow. Local drag performers will be judged by three big talents. Now Mary Walsh, who Moonlight says Mark Delahunty, will be there. And so will Lady Bunny, a longtime drag performer from New York City. And our Jeremy Eaton sat down with a third judge, Irma Gerd, to learn more about the show and a lot more, as well as the whole story behind the local scene. Jeremy, we're ready for you in makeup. How long have you been Irma? I've been doing drag for about five years. And how's the local community grown, I guess, in the last five years since you've been it in Irma? It has snowballed so much. It is wonderful. The last year, especially. How long does it take you to become Irma? Uh, it takes me. It can take up to four hours. How would you describe your look? Uh, zany, wonderful, fun. What are people going to see on Saturday? down at the uh, Queen of the Night. So it's gonna be three rounds, uh, and each round somebody is going to get eliminated. So we'll start with five, round two, there will be four, all the way down. So is this basically strictly based on look, and, or is there a performance there aspect? There is a, definitely a performance aspect. It is, it's based on, I guess, also look a little bit, but mostly performance. And what sort of performance, song, dance? Lip sync is Lip -sync. the standard for drag. <laughs> Why Irma Gerd? Oh, she likes a pun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I started doing drag in about, I don't know, 2013, 2014, and that meme was big on the internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the fans are so fun. They're the, the whole reason I do it is like this low level local gay celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> Irma meets the BC. <laughs> I saw that. They yes. came into our makeup area. Oh, yeah. The ladies' makeup yeah. and took it over. <laughs> wow. Kind of fetching, but I'll never sleep again. <laughs> <laughs> so they, this is a big deal for uh, the performers uh, mm -hmm. tomorrow night, the first. Yeah, big huh? deal for Jeremy, too. <laughs> <laughs> Supply and demand got out of hand and shops ran out of weed. So public scorn was heaped upon the poor old NLC. He's at it again, Sean Panting, put under pressure to pen a timely tune about something you haven't heard about this week, pot.
I would be a total townie, I guess people would say, <laughs> because I grew up like very downtown centered. And uh, that's where I feel at home. I think when you're from here, you can't help but just be connected. You're just so naturally embedded in that larger tapestry of all these wonderful St. John's colors and stories and people. Good morning, 705. You're listening to the St. John's Morning Show here. Hosting the Morning Show is awesome because we're the first up. We get to wake people up in the morning and it's kind of interesting because you come in here and it's so quiet, there's nobody else around, yet you are your listener's company for the morning. So, I don't know, you feel that connection with people, I think. We're gonna take this step by step. The best part of living in Newfoundland is there is no end to interesting stories that come from here. There's a lot going on here, and I think every day we're just trying to figure it all out. I'm loving those promos. Yeah. yeah. Fred and Chrissy, really, really nice. Yeah, Fred's Way got a good do. golf swing. Yeah. I noticed. I know. Nice dogs, too, both of them. Everybody has dogs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, how are the dogs going to make out in the rain tomorrow? Oh, it's going to be pretty nasty, hey? Yeah, I wouldn't put your dogs out, <laughs> yeah. out this weekend. Right. Yeah, for parts of, uh, well, most of the island, really. We are looking at significant rainfall amounts. Uh, if we take a look at, we'll jump right into the forecast for tomorrow. Temperatures are actually going to climb up into the afternoons uh, from what we saw today. So, about 10 degrees in St. John's. It should be a generally cloudy day. Might see a few peaks of sun. Uh, uh, but most of that rain will start for the south coast heavy at times through the afternoon at a high near uh, 12 degrees for Port of Basque, 11 in Corner Brook. Those southwest winds uh, upwards of about 80 kilometers per hour exposed areas likely upwards of about 100 kilometers per hour. Grand Falls winds are 10 degrees, St. Anthony sitting at 8 and then up through uh, Labrador. That's where it should be pretty messy it looks like. So. Four degrees should be the afternoon uh, or what it should sit as in the afternoon towards the evening hours. Those temperatures are actually going to jump up for specifically Happy Valley Goose Bay, probably closer to eight degrees by the time the evening rolls around. All of that snow will change over to rain into the afternoon. Cartwright sitting around three degrees as well. So if we take a look at uh, those special weather statement yet again, uh, that rainfall warning in place for the south coast and then Nain right now under that special weather statement likely changing over to a snowfall warning in the next uh, 12 hours, probably uh, tonight. So here's a look at what we're going to see by tomorrow morning. Again, that snow pushing in through Labrador uh, into the afternoon, changing over to rain. But if we zoom out, look how large this system is. It's bringing all of that moisture up and then just continuing as we head through the day tomorrow and into Sunday as it continues to track a little bit further east and then even more so on Monday things will finally start to clear out and then taper to flurries up uh, up through Labrador. So timing out this uh, these strong winds into tomorrow morning or rather Sunday morning. We'll see those strongest winds and then eventually pushing further east. It'll uh, quickly clear out in behind that as far as winds go but stay quite strong into Sunday. By the time Monday rolls around, things will uh, ease slightly, but still pretty strong through the afternoon. So here's a look at those snowfall amounts by uh, Saturday morning, staying at about 12 centimeters, 12 to 15 is possible, and changing over to rain. You can see as much as 10 millimeters for Happy Valley Goose Bay. And then rainfall amounts, Starting Saturday night is when we'll see that heaviest rain. You can see it, how quickly it accumulates. Uh, 42 for Bergio, St. Albans, about 25 millimeters. Then look Sunday into Monday morning, 102 for St. Albans. Now these uh, amounts could exceed 175 towards the inland areas, but uh, a number of areas seeing between 70 and 90 millimeters of rain. So quite significant amounts expected. So uh, five day forecast, you can see temperatures jumping up to about 16 degrees for St. John's and East. Uh, by the time Sunday rolls around, then dipping back down into Tuesday, we're gonna see that same thing for Western Newfoundland rain on Sunday, Monday showers, maybe even some flurries on Tuesday night. And then Monday afternoon, again, things generally clearing out, but not before 60 to even 80 millimeters of rainfalls. Again, those temperatures up to 16 degrees and then up through Labrador. Snow changing to rain, dropping back down on Sunday, staying quite cold right into midweek next week. And then we're going to see that same thing for eastern Labrador. So that's a look at uh, the next couple of days. We'll have your weather photo coming up in a little bit. Debbie?
It is time now for a weekly installment of the St. John's Morning Show's Panting Under Pressure. Mm -hmm. Musician Sean Panting has to write and perform a hot topic tune that's suggested by a listener of the St. John's Morning Show, and he has just one hour to turn that around. So that's a fair bit of pressure. Mm -hmm. No surprise for this week's suggested theme, pen a pop song about pot. On Wednesday past, some changes fast came to our drug laws when liberal types ignored the gripes and folks let folks at the draws. Gone are the days when stoners blaze to stick it to the man. Now half the town will burn one down just cause now they can. Thank you. If all goes right, the future's bright. Now ganja's running free. Not free as such, just twice as much as prices used to be. As government tries to monetize this vital income stream and help offset the fiscal mess Astaldi's left us in. Astaldi. <clears throat> Happy potheads counted down and marked the blessed day. Lining up life, lining up for pot like tickets to, tickets to come from away. Supply and demand got out of hand and shops ran out of weed. So public scorn was heaped upon the poor old NLC. All over town, entrepreneurs are opening their shops. But just because it's legal now, don't save you from the cops. They showed up there at Cannabis Care and put that plan on ice. And the boys, they say it goes to show you can't have nothing nice. <laughs> Don't need much gears and weed and beer, chip flavors you enjoy. It's a major hand for your favorite bands, Snoop Dogg and Pink Floyd. It may seem strange, but little's changed. The folks, the folks you know are getting stoned. Most like they already were. Oh dear. Oh no. <laughs> well, there's nothing like a bonger pipe to get that traffic slowed. Pedestrians just standing there like turkeys in the road <laughs> to interject, drive and wreck his extra special dumb. Don't spark one up in the car or truck. Don't be so friggin' stunned. <laughs> oh, look at this oh, shot. Bonus. Beautiful rainbow there. That's one of my favorite things about after a shower and the, and the sun comes out. See a rainbow there? I certainly do. Lovely. Do you have any idea? Uh, the I've, islands. The hills. Uh, <laughs> salt water. Central. Yeah, yeah, that's good. All right, it's uh, Red Indian Lake. No. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll tell you where that shot was taken coming up after the break.
back, everyone. Well, it's Friday, uh -huh. so. Mm -hmm. A tradition on Here and Now. Let's find out who's celebrating. Happy birthday to Irene Genge of Glovertown, who celebrated her 90th birthday yesterday. Happy 50th anniversary wishes going out to Clarence and Gay Rumbold of Mary's Harbor. Anniversary greetings to Jack and Mary Budden of Stephenville celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary coming up on the 25th. Best wishes today to Melvin and Ida Crummy of Western Bay who are celebrating their 50th anniversary. Happy birthday to Bessie Redmond who turned 90 years old on Monday. And a happy 54th wedding anniversary to Gordon and Nettie Peckford in Gander, who celebrated on Wednesday. Congratulations to Wallace and Doris Moore from Carmenville on their 55th wedding anniversary. And a happy 51st anniversary this Sunday to Shirley and Glenn Young, formerly of Newfoundland, now living in Ontario. Also celebrating their anniversary this Sunday, congratulations to Charlie and Clara Strobridge in Mount Pearl on their 55th anniversary. And congratulations to Harold Priddle in Victoria, now in Carbonear, who turned 96 years of age last Sunday. And wishing Millie George in Whiteaway, Trinity Bay, a happy 93rd birthday. Her special day was on Wednesday. Happy 90th birthday yesterday to Eva White of Deer Lake. Congratulations to Mary T. Lewis of Colliers, who celebrated her 90th birthday yesterday. Happy birthday to Dorothy Taylor French, formerly of Cupids, now living in Whitby, Ontario, who will celebrate her 91st birthday this Sunday. Happy 90th birthday to Janie Lang of Carboneer. Happy 60th wedding anniversary to George and Adelaide Thornhill of Foxtrap Conception Bay South, formerly of Fortune. Happy 52nd anniversary to Linda and Dermot Malloy from Trepassi. And Ella Hunter in beautiful Salvage and her husband Bob Yetman from St. Mary's Bay. They were married 50 years ago yesterday. Congratulations and I hope you got that boat named after Ella out of the water on time. And best wishes to Madonna and John Murdoch in Kilbride who celebrate 50 years of marriage on October the 26th. And 50th anniversary greetings to Elmo and Sybil Noseworthy in St. Anthony. Their anniversary was on Wednesday. And it's a golden anniversary today for Peter and Rita Parsons of Fortune. Well done. And a happy 51st anniversary to Roosevelt and Lillian Thompson in Point Leamington. They celebrate tomorrow. And it's 60th anniversary wishes to Bill and Marjorie Young from Glen Burnie, Bombay. It's a 64th anniversary tomorrow for Ruth and Ralph James from Codroy. James and Nina Perry, formerly of Nippers Harbor, now in St. John's, will be celebrating their 52nd wedding anniversary on Sunday. Best wishes to David and Barbara Butler in Kellegrews Conception Bay South on their 50th anniversary yesterday. Happy 65th wedding anniversary today to Tom and Ruby, Ruby Walsh of Cornerbrook. Happy birthday to Joe Carew of St. John's who's celebrating his 90th birthday today. Also celebrating today, it's a happy 94th birthday to Rachel Roberts, formerly of Cowhead, now in Bombay. And happy 92nd birthday to Donald Carter of Batcher's Key, now in Mount Pearl. I'm looking bunch of people celebrating again this week, yes. so congratulations. Some with the right accoutrements <laughs> and beverages, I noticed. Yes, I noticed. Is it a magnum, I think? What a way to celebrate. Champagne. Why not? Why not? It's the big only exactly. way to celebrate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, we're going to have a look at that lovely picture you posted. Yeah, just before the break, we uh, showed you this photo of the rainbow. Yeah. Can you guess central? Yeah, I was kind of wrongish. Yeah, a little bit wrong. Right. It's okay. It I have no idea. No, no idea. Well, this photo is uh, just outside of uh, Springdale in Kings Point. So gorgeous shot there. Thank you so much uh, for sending that in, Joyce Ride Out. If you have any weather photos that you'd like to send, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca and we'll get them on the show. And earlier in the summer before you were here, when Carolyn was showing us pictures, there were so many of rainbow. That's true, yeah. It was a lot of rain and uh, I was driving from Central Home, saw two, and then a faint third one. Wow. I've never, never seen, seen that, that Double before. rainbow, third rainbow. And people were pulling off the highway to take pictures. It right. was just spectacular. Yeah, yeah, I love and it. Debbie went out looking for three pots of gold <laughs> instead of just one of them, right? But I'm here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we're so glad you are. That means you, you didn't are. find we're much, did you? <laughs> <laughs> Thank 
you so today. much for being Not that we're underpaid a or anything like that. Week. Uh, full week. How, how are you feeling? I am loving this. This yeah. is great. Excellent. Weather, so much weather. Good. You can nice. stick around. Yeah, nice to have you. See you on Monday. Enjoy your weekend. <laughs> Good night.